are very pleased to start our annual joint conference, Columbia University and Ono Academic College. And we will start with the Chief Justice of uh, Delaware, Chief Justice Leo Strain. Please. I'm ordinarily known as a fairly funny guy, but uh, Ted Mervis, many of you may know Mr. Mervis, he, in, he instructed me that I'm not allowed to be funny. Uh, he thought I would offend your sensibilities. I believe it's just mostly because I'm one of the few people funnier than Ted, and he was afraid to go on after me. Um, I was actually asked by Zohar, and it's an honor to be in your wonderful country and to be at this excellent law school and with esteemed members of your judiciary. Um, it's, it's a real honor for me. Um, and my driver could not find the place. That was a little disorienting. <laughs> then I went in the different entrance, and I freaked Zohar out. But I was actually about the second person in the room with the videographer. I've been sitting here for a half hour waiting, saying, where is the audience? And uh, you were all downstairs. And Now, I, I'm going to give you the single secret to Delaware corporate law, our success. It's that Delaware is so boring. There's no great historical sites like Jerusalem. There's none of the sites of Tel Aviv that uh, Ted has told me I'm not allowed to talk about or even think about. It's just boring, which is allows us to contemplate principles of corporate law, because there's nothing else to do. So in the time allotted to me, I don't even know what it is anymore, but uh, I'm going to t tell you everything I know about how we do corporate law. And that's really what I'm going to do. And I think I can actually do it in 30 minutes because it's not as complex as people make it out to be. It's actually fairly fundamentally simple. And I actually think a lot of times judges complicate things, practitioners complicate things, academics comp complicate things. As I said, I, I find it odd, Zohar, I'm going to risk this, Ted, to have a paper about tunneling just seems strange, you know. Academics have strange turns of phrases, and uh, not what I expected, but uh, you know, go for it, Ron. And, uh, but how did we get here in Delaware? Like, why am I here? Why is this bald guy from the States here? Well, you know, if you think about the United States where we went through, corporations are a relatively new phenomenon. We have a few justices on our United States Supreme Court who think everybody under anticipated them, understood them to be ExxonMobil. That's not really true. At the founding of our nation in the United States, the only corporations were specifically chartered by government. Every corporation was authorized by a legislature for specific purposes. And the legislature set forth those purposes. One of the classic corporations of is the, the, the Dutch in, as East Indies corporations. But in the United States of America, it was the same. We had corporations that were chartered by governments to do specific bridges, to do other kinds of projects. And there was a doctrine called the ultra vires doctrine. And essentially, corporations could only do what was in their specific legislatively authorized charter. We then went to what's called general chartering. That's where you get the term, you've ever anybody heard of the Delaware General Corporation Law? Well, the term general is because it's essentially an off-the-shelf charter. You can form a charter yourself using the default provisions of that law. So you didn't have to go to the legislature anymore. You could go to a Secretary of State's office or something like that and do a charter that was in compliance with this general statute. Now what happened at the beginning of that is there's a period of transition from being very, very specific with the legislature setting things up to these general statutes. And it was often, and the original statutes often had very specific provisions to protect the people who entrusted their capital. Um, for example, mergers often required unanimous consent of all the stockholders. Interested transactions, a conflict of interest transaction, were tended to be invalid unless 100% of the equity holders 
went along with it. So you sort of evolved into this period of where you'd form a corporation and you started taking other people's money, right? When they were governmentally chartered, um, the government tended to control the ownership or allocate the ownership rights. Then you have the general corporation law. People could start businesses, take money from other people. You have the statutes being fairly specific about how you could deal with people's money. Um, and it was very contractarian. Well, over time, those statutes became more and more what we call in Delaware broadly enabling, which is less restrictive. Um, the managers of the corporation began to be able to do more without stockholder votes. And you had, and what was the protection that was used for the equity owners? Because from the beginning, if you think about it in the United States, what we're trying to do is balance two things entrepreneurial energy, managerial competence, the kind of vision you have of somebody who founds a business. You don't want to stifle that, right? People have a vision, they want to pursue it. You can't have them being intruded upon day to day. They need to plan, they need to be able to depend on um, making decisions. On the other hand, you have people who's putting their money up and they want to make sure that the business is being run faithfully to their interests. They don't want to be stolen from. So what the U.S. has tried to balance from the beginning is those two things, which is not stifling the ability of managers to innovate, to run the business, to adapt, while protecting the expectations, the fair expectations of people who entrust capital. So you get this broadly enabling statute. What is the concern that sort of arises, right? Wait a minute. How are we going to do these transactions? How are we going to let them manage it without more control? There's a guy named Adolph Burley, who's sort of a famous guy. He's a New Dealer, actually. He was one of Roosevelt's aides. But he's very uh, famous in corporate law for talking about the so-called separation of ownership and control. And he's actually a very famous person affiliated with a uh, distinguished law school um, who's a co-host here because he was a Columbia guy. Well, what he talked about was he, was he was concerned that as more and more people gave their money to corporations and they weren't really involved in the control of them anymore, right? They became broadly thing that the managers would become too powerful. Throughout Burley's whole career, he was concerned with unaccountable economic power. But, and so what he talked about with the corporate law and what we do in Delaware about that is he talked about every corporate action being twice tested. And that's why I said, I, I'm going to simplify things, which is I had a chief justice before. All great Delaware corporate law judges have to have hairlines like Henry Hansman and I, Bill Allen, some of you met. This one had a very different hairline. He was not willing to sacrifice his vanity for the sake of the cause. But he once he was at this conference, he said, well, there's like 30 kinds of corporate cases. You got your Revlon case, you got your Unical case, you got your case with the sale of all the assets of the company, you got your Van Gorkum case, you got your Con V. Lynch, you got your books and records case. And I kind of, a few minutes later, I raised my hand and I said, you know, I, I, I'm a, just a vice chancellor. I'm going to say something. I don't want to offend my distinguished chief justice. I think there's basically two kinds of corporate cases. And this is important to sort of understand our law. You got your law case, and then you got your equity case. Okay? Now, we got, I talked about this broadly enabling statute. Well, one of the things that Burley was concerned about was making sure how do we make sure that these managers are faithful to their interests? And one of the things that he wrote about, and there's a lot of controversy about it, but this twice-tested concept has really endured, is the first layer of analysis in the case of actually when you're asking about a corporate director any action is, is it lawful? What's it mean to be lawful? Does it comply with the statute? Does it comply with the go governing instruments of the corporation, certificate of incorporation of bylaws, some contract that applies? That's the first layer of testing. Now, we have a broadly enabling statute, which means there's often a lot of flexibility for managers to take action without stockholder approval. Now, there are vestiges of the old law. For example, most mergers require stockholder approval, sale of all the assets. We have annual elections of directors. But there's a lot of actions that directors can take without formal stockholder approval. And remember, if you have a controlling stockholder, the vote and the vote is controlled by the controlling stockholder, the fact that the other stockholders get the vote on it 
doesn't really matter that much. So what does it mean to be twice tested? That's where the equity side, the second kind of question comes in. Equity, what is equity? Fiduciary duties. Part of our success in Delaware is fiduciary duties, which the equity courts were what arose in England that temper the harshness of the law. And when the former rules of the law didn't provide for something, equity could intrude to protect the legitimate interests of people. Trustees, executors were seen as species of fiduciary. Well, corporate directors became, were seen as fiduciaries. Delaware's court of equity was the court of chancery. And that's what began to enforce all aspects of the corporate law, the law side and the equity side. So well, how does this twice-tested concept come in? Well, the fact that you do something that's compliant with the statute doesn't mean you pass muster. The twice-tested concept is that what you have to do has to be consistent with your fiduciary duties, which is the, and the primary one of that really is the duty of loyalty which is the idea that what you do is supposed to be in the best interest of the company and its stockholders and not of yourself. And it really doesn't matter what other interest you pursue, whether it's because you like flowers, whether it's you like your family, it's whether you like yourself. The reality is you're supposed to put the corporation and the best interests of all the stockholders as equity holders first. And so we have a maxim in Delaware that says simply because it's lawful doesn't mean it's equitable. And so what Burley was talking about, and really is the central feature of our law, is that everything is twice tested. You can't just do something that's lawful. You also have to do something that's consistent with your fiduciary duties. If the court decides that it's not consistent with your fiduciary duties, it can enjoin the action or hold you accountable in damages. Now, how does this manifest itself? Well, the central organizing principle is the business judgment rule. What's this fancy thing, the business judgment rule? Really what it is, is it's the doctrine, I think our, uh, Steve Bainbridge, who's a, uh, a curmudgeonly favorite professor of mine from UCLA, who I urge you to read his blog just for his food and wine recommendations, really, as much as anything. Um, he calls it an abstention doctrine, and that's, I think, kind of exactly right, which is what it is, is the notion is if the right people with the right motivations make the decision, that you're best not having people like Strine, who were trained to be lawyers, decide whether a business judgment was correct or not. I got a little caffeine from a company called Coke. Many of you are too young and attractive to remember that one of the disasters for Coca-Cola was something called the new Coke. It was a disaster, right? It was rolled out. Some of you do remember this. It was rolled out with great fanfare at great expense, and it was a huge failure. Now, if you want to hold the Coca-Cola board liable and the managers liable for that, that would deter them from doing things like that. Now, it might sound good, right? New Coke stunk, except one of the most successful corporations in the world in the period following that was Coca-Cola. And so the idea has been, you know, businesses, Henry Ford, it took him several times to finally develop the car. If you're going to punish people for taking risk and they don't get most of the benefit of the risk, they're just not going to take the risk. And for diversified stockholders, if people are taking risk for the right reason, you don't want to punish them simply because something goes wrong. Because it doesn't mean that they were negligent. It doesn't mean that they, f they failed to prepare. It just means it's a risky and changing world. And so the idea behind the business judgment rule is if you're convinced that the board of directors is properly motivated, you generally just stay out. And of course, then there's the corollary to the business edge rule, which is what if you think they're improperly motivated? The controlling stockholder has a brother who owns a company that happens to sell a product that the company uses. And the exclusive supplier is that brother's company. All right. All the reasons why you would ordinarily trust the company to try to do what's in your best interest go out the window, right? When we do that, we have what we call the entire fairness standard which is when somebody is conflicted and it's a conflict of interest standard, you change the whole scope of judicial review. And the burden then becomes, because the idea becomes, how do we know that this is really a market price? How do we know that you're getting the best deal when you're going an exclusive supply arrangement with your brother's company? You need to prove to the court that it's fair. The burden is on you. And if you can't, 
we can make you, one, discourage the benefits, reverse the contract, or make you pay damages. What that, and that's seen as a very, very difficult standard of review to survive, and it's intentionally seen that way. Because the whole idea is actually to create an incentive to, for fair dealing and for people to actually market test transactions. But even then, right, do courts in Delaware, do we sort of lightly, and this is one of the policy issues you have to think about for your nation, is there's still a reluctance of courts in Delaware over time to get into the economics of transactions. So that if you had an interested transaction and you could have a majority of the directors were actually independent directors or not controlled by the controller and they would approve it, you would get credit for that. Or if you would go to the disinterested stockholders and say, approve the transaction, you'd get credit for that in varying degrees. But it would temper that harshness of that review standard, and that what, what would that do? That would encourage controllers to set up fair processes, to put more independent directors on, to give the vote to people. That allowed the courts to step back a little bit from in be, intervening in the economics of it because the right people were being allowed to protect themselves. Pro rata treatment. That's a big safe harbor for controllers. If you sell, your, sell the company and you take the same amount as the minority, traditionally that's been something you got great credit for and it's a good safe harbor. That aligns the interests of the majority and the minority, and it's something that you want to encourage, and therefore the courts try to stay, to stay out. And so there's this sort of organizing principle of our law to even when you're outside the notion of the pure business judgment rule, to try to give credit to people if they can replicate the structures of an arm's length transaction and disinterested decision making. And takeovers, and we have one of the you know, most sophisticated participants in that de debate about how the United States would regulate takeovers in Ron Gilson here. Um, you know, There's a big debate in the United States when takeovers came. What should Delaware do? One of the views was that the boards of directors should just stay out of takeovers. We should just not get involved at all. It should be between the stockholders and the boards. Then there was another view from Marty Lipton, Ted Mervis's partner, that you know, it really should be just like business judgment rule. And then there were even some people saying it should be entire fairness, that every time a board of directors faces a takeover bid, it's a conflict of interest. These are kind of awkward things. The solution of passivity didn't really work in the American process because we actually didn't have any fair price rules. We didn't have structures. People were able to make abusive offers, the so-called two-tier two tender offer where, you know, you better tender in because if you got stuck on the back end, um, you know, you got vestiges of my hairline. As, uh, and so it wasn't really a fair thing. There weren't, it wasn't like the city code in London so what happened is Delaware adapted, and what it did was directors were put in the center. Did you get business judgment rule treatment? No, the court ratcheted up the standard review to the so-called intermediate standard. And you got extra special credit, like there's, an, uh, there's this thing called the omnispector pre, you know, presence of entrenchment. It's like the omnipresent specter is what, like an oligarch in Russia, it's like Putin. Putin on their, his mind, right? If you're an oligarch, you know, Putin knows how you got the money, probably helped you get it, but he knows you got the money. Is it time to go back and visit and show your loyalty? But if you go back, are you going to get arrested? Well, so the omnip like that is the omnipresent specter, the fear from a professor's is always managerial entrenchment, agency costs, the agency cost story, right? Well, what group of directors was seen as less subject to the agency costs? Independent directors. So what was set up with this standard where the court would look more intensively at a takeover defense, the directors had to come up with the reason they were acting, there was a proportionality test, and you got extra special credit for acting through independent directors. And Delaware also adapted in a way, where we have a strong Republican model, and this is often mistaken by scholars who will uh, be careful of scholars who talk about confused means and ends. The fact that Delaware empowers directors does not mean that the ends of corporation law in Delaware are not strongly stockholder focused. 
they are intensely stockholder focused. But the means of corporate governance is a Republican model, unlike a direct democracy model. In European corporate governance, for example, the ends of corporate governance are often multi-constituency. But there is a non-frustration code. Does that mean it's a more open takeover market? It actually really doesn't. The directors don't have a duty to maximize shareholder valor, value. It's not really that focused. In the US, we hold directors accountable through a Republican model to advance the interests of stockholders. So along with this intermediate standard review became, came very strong protection of the shareholder franchise and the ability to elect a new board of directors if you don't like them. And takeover bidders along with using the intense scrutiny on the independent directors of the standard also use the proxy contest to advance their things. And that's Delaware, another way that Delaware, the courts stay out of business decisions is by policing the franchise closely. The shareholders have an opportunity to elect a board of their choosing. There's more legitimacy to a board when there's that kind of vibrant elected process and there's more reason to defer to them. So even in terms of navigating through the takeover markets, you see this fidelity to the idea of dis disinterested decision making. Interestingly, the so-called duty of care, which you've probably read about, the, next, the only time we really enforce the duty of care is in aid of the central concern of loyalty. In almost all the areas like Unical, Revlon, or cases involving controlling stockholder mergers where there's a focus on the duty of care, why is there a focus on the duty of care? It's a focus on the duty of care of the independent directors to see whether they have actually put the controller or the interested party to the market test. You're looking at their effectiveness really to see whether the loyalty problem at, at the bottom is cured. And so there's very few care cases actually outside the dynamic of the role of the independent directors in addressing some of the structural concerns of conflict of interest of the board. It all kind of comes back to loyalty and motivations. And for something that's relevant to you all, we do have a lot of controllers in the United States. Even Burley overstated at the earlier era separation of ownership and control, there were a lot of controlled US companies. How have we dealt with controlled mergers? Well, we gave people credit for special committees of independent directors negotiating them. We gave them credit for majority of the minority. But what was interesting is when you, under our statute, a merger has to be approved typically by the board of directors and there's a stockholder vote. So if you think about those, those are not um, substitutes for each other, they're complements, right? What does the board of directors role do? Well, you have somebody, right? We're all a big group of people. It's very difficult for us to negotiate for ourselves. We need a centralized agent to do that. So in the context of a merger, the board of directors approves it, negotiates. The merger can trade off against different negotiating parties. Then the stockholders get to say, do we like what our agents did? We get to vote for ourselves. So over time, there's this tug and pull. But recently, the point was, even if you do a controlling stockholder merger, if you can replicate an arm's length merger fully, the court will stay out. And how do you replicate it fully? Well, you have to have a negotiating agent, which is a special committee of independent directors that's empowered to actually negotiate, have their own advisors, and say no to the controller. So that replicates what the board does in a third party deal. Then you have to have a, vote, a majority of the minority vote. So the minority stockholders get to choose for themselves whether they approve. And it has to be a fully informed vote. So we are very vigilant about what you tell, give people information about. But we've recently concluded if you do both of those things, the courts should not examine the substantive fairness of the deal. Now, why do we do that? Well, if you don't actually give them credit for that, you know what, the controllers, they don't have any incentive to use those things, at least under our law. And as a result, you found stockholders not getting the benefits of both of these complementary devices. You also found we have a very litigious culture. And there was a lot of frivolous litigation brought that just raised the cost of capital and no benefit to the stockholders. Because it turned out, frankly, that special committees do a pretty good job in comparison to third-party deals. I think most of the evidence is that the 
the transactional values in those cases because of the role that the fairness review, the, the process provides and the leverage it gives the independent directors. And there's a backstop, I won't talk a lot about appraisal, but there's the ability to get appraisal. When you put these two things together, there's a real incentive for controllers to have to pay a hefty price if they're gonna take out the minority. But as you see in all this stuff, right, what are those conditions? What the court did was by doctrine, try to replicate the conditions under which the business judgment rule applies, which is disinterested board decision making it's ultimately the independent directors who get the ability to say yes or no. They don't have a conflict of interest. And in the merger context, you get the vote yourself as the minority. And so when those conditions which replicate the ordinary business decisions exist, then the court is going to give deference. And so our law has attempted to be flexible and adaptive by encouraging board behavior that is generally good. What does that mean? I mean we, I think, aim to have the market standard be very good to excellent rather than to have each transaction reviewed for perfection. There's no doubt that there's cost to any legal rule. If you set up a rule, for example, where it's a special committee of independent directors, fully informed vote of the minority, and full disclosure. There's no question that there could be circumstances in which somebody gets away with something hinky. But if the overall value to diversified investors of that model is powerful, if it's the most efficient way to go about things and it actually cuts excessive litigation costs and prudence fairness, then that's the best overall rule. And I think what we err on the side of is doing things that we think are stru encourage structural fairness are the, likely to strike the best benefit to cost ratio for investors. And to balance those two things that I talked about, which is managerial, the ability of man managers to innovate, to not be subject to disruption on a constant basis, but where people can entrust their capital knowing that they'll be protected against self-dealing, that they'll be fairly um, treated in mergers and acquisitions. And I think it's actually worked out you know, there's a lot of criticisms you can make of the U.S. system. I don't think you can make a criticism of the U.S. system that if you're an investor, you don't get access to sell-side takeover premiums. I don't think you can make an argument in the U.S. system that when there are controlling stockholder mergers, you don't get treated fairly. I don't think there's any argument in the U.S. system that there's a lot of um, self-dealing. And in fact, what's the most interesting is the biggest debated issue about agency costs now is sort of executive compensation. And the people who are directly responsible for the soaring executive compensation are institutional investors in the United States. Institutional investors in the United States begged for compensation to be tied to options. They did not want, they wanted direct, they wanted corporate managers to manage to the market. And they did not want to pay them in cash because cash is real value. They didn't even want to give them restricted stock. Why didn't they want to give restricted stock? Because restricted stock has a value. They wanted options. They wanted people to outsource. They wanted people to cut and slash. They wanted people to be subject to removal at the polls and to being insecure. And they got what they wanted. They got a class of people who are less respected. They got a class of people whose incentives are tied to the thermometer of the stock market. And that's what they got. But the reality is the biggest agency cost in the United States, to the extent it is one, is one that institutional investors actually seek out. They tend to still want to pay CEOs in this way. Um, that's not something Delaware can do much about because we actually do give stockholders a lot of clout. But one of the things, and I'll leave you with, was just that we've come to an interesting era. The separation of ownership from capital is the old story. One of the things I confuse American audiences with all the time is say, which companies are most American stockholders? And people raise their hand, they say, Apple and Google. It's not even close. It's Fidelity, Barclays, BlackRock, Vanguard. Most Americans do not get to buy individual equities. They have to give their money in their retirement plans to mutual funds. 
I call it the separation of ownership from ownership. When you talk about stockholders, there's this mythology that we're still back in the day of Adolf Burley. We are not. We haven't been there for a long time. It's simpler for academics to talk about it. Ron, to his credit, has written in a more complicated way about it. I think Zohar is writing about it. Some other people are stuck in a little primitive, more primitive story uh, about loving the I don't know why they trust money. They trust money managers more than they trust people who run companies. It's a very strange thing. Uh, but we're now in a point where capital has re-aggregated. Capital is not weak and diffuse. It's actually re-aggregating. It's going to come your way. But it's coming in a very confused and bizarre circumstance, in a sort of context. The people who trust, who say they want stockholders to vote on anything, you know what they don't want stockholders to be able to decide? what they can vote on. Most institutional investors would vote on far fewer things if they were allowed. But the people who argue for them to have power will not let them decide that. Institutional investors are bewildered by the number of votes. That's why in the US you'll see them voting for the same pay plan four years in a row at Ceausescu-like majorities. I used to drive my court reporters crazy. I'd say Ceausescu. Uh, that's the former Romanian. Prime Minister, 95%, same pay plan. Then what happens? The company has a bad year. ISS, institutional, um, whatever services they are. Um, I'm on film, so I won't give you my secret name for them. But they change their recommendation. And the plan either goes down, the plan, the plan either goes down or the vote changes by 30%, only because of their recommendation. Academics have studied this. The principal factor on pay plans is ISS recommendation. What does the ISS recommendation change? Is it because the pay plan changed? No, it's the exact same pay plan they voted for for four years in a row by over 90 percent. The company had a sucky year. That's an American technical term for a suboptimal year, sucky year. Um, that's not maturity. We have pay, say on pay votes every single year. Why would you pay a CEO from a year to year basis? I tried to urge every three or four years. ISS, oh no, we have to have him every year. Well, when people vote on things that they can't think about, they don't really make an informed vote. There's a lot of noise and cost to the system for investors. There are people in the middle who make money off of the hoo-ha. Who is the most vocal in the US system? Is it the most rational? The most rational investors are people who invest in index funds. Arguably, the least rational people are people who, vote, who invest in actively traded mutual funds because you get churning of stocks, active trading with no benefits of control. Hedge funds come close to next for irrational. Private equity is probably next to index funds with the most rational. But who has the most voice in the system? It's the marginal trader. It's the, um, it's the actively traded funds. It's the political pension funds. They are the ones who exert the most pressure on the company, and they're the ones who are most who are the least aligned with rational thinking and with long-term business planning. And one of the debates we're having in the U.S. right now is what are the responsibilities that we talked about fiduciary duties. What are the responsibilities of the direct fiduciaries of most investors? Because here's the other model. The passive model, the Burley model, was that these stockholders were weak and disaggregated. They didn't act on companies. Well, there's a whole different thing now. You have people who are exerting leverage on public companies putting pressure on them to implement strategies. And those strategies will affect other investors, the employees, the society. And what are the duties of those investors to other people if their plans go wrong and their leverage strategies go wrong? And so that's the phase of the capital markets we're at in the United States and we're grappling with it. Delaware, actually, we're very disciplined about this. We don't distinguish, we don't discriminate against stockholders. The rights, the obligations of institutional investors are actually largely governed by federal law, which largely is not ex existent on this point. But it's coming your way. Europe is probably about 15 to 20 years behind the United States on this, but it's coming. ISS is there. As you get more companies that go from controlled status to having a larger thing, you can bet there'll be pressures because there's, there's also a homogenization of corporate law. Around the world, these interest groups have their model. And they like their playbook, and their playbook is pretty much the same everywhere. 
And so they'll push for say on pay. They'll first, they'll push for more independent directors. But as soon as they get the independent directors, they'll push for votes on every single thing that the independent directors do. What I would urge you to think about is whether you're getting a better model out of that. And I think one of the things you've got to adjust, I know you have some of the rules we have on controllers, is how litigation intensive do you want your approach to be? Do you want the courts looking at the substantive fairness of transactions or do you want the courts creating good incentives? What are going to be the responsibilities of people who litigate then if they're using other people's money to litigate because that has cost for the other investors? What are you going to do when people come in, activist groups want to make runs at your companies? What are the responsibilities of people like proxy advisors? For example, I think it's an outrage still that we don't require index funds to get index specific voting, uh, have index specific voting policies. I'll tell you one story to finish on the U.S. that just shows the problem we have. I took a little, have you ever heard of a socially responsible mutual fund? Do you have this? It's like funds that say we don't invest in environmental polluters, we, don't, we, we pick our stocks. Well, I looked at one of the funds and I said, how did they vote on social proposals? The socially responsible fund at one of the leading mutual funds in the country, and one of the funds that actually does it the best. When they buy and sell stocks, they pick them on a socially responsible basis. When they vote on stockholder proposals, they vote exactly like the dividend momentum fund, <laughs> the emerging markets fund. So they were voting against climate change resolutions, fair worker treatment provisions, totally bizarre. Why? Because there's one lever pulled at that entire complex and every single fund votes the same way. That's why index funds sometimes vote on both sides of a merger. They'll vote on the, buy, on the sell side of a merger because they like the premium. And they'll vote against it on the buy side because they're paying too much. <laughs> but they own both stocks. <laughs> and that's where I'm saying we got a lot to think about. It's coming your way. What I'd say in terms of the, the core thing on the controller side is I do think that there's a lot of experience out there that you can learn from with the special committees with the votes. And I'd, I'd err, I'd say based on my experience, I'd err on the side of good structural incentives. Because I think with these mobilized capital, to be honest, one of the things they are very good at is protecting the expectations of their investors in the context of high stakes M&A transactions. It's very unlikely if you get mutual funds or institutions in that in the context of a going private, they're not going to be intensely interested in it. And if they're given a sufficient amount of voting power and you have a sufficiently vibrant electoral process, then I think that you're going to find that the outcomes on those dimensions are pretty good. And that where you'd probably want to reserve the most intensive judicial review is the kind of ongoing kind of self-dealing that's the old school Italian <laughs> style. But I've, I've, uh, you've been very patient with me. I don't, Ted didn't flash me the five minutes, but I think I'm okay. And I, I'm also, I'm willing, I'm through here through the day. I know it's the traditional kind of more European style, but I'm open to questions at any time during the day. And thank you um, for being patient with me.